So welcome. Uh, we're going to learn about the Cold War tonight. Uh, between myself, David Olson from uh, Retro Report, uh, joined here by uh, Genevieve Kaplan uh, from the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna share all sorts of of wonderful and very free resources for you uh, to to see you know if we can find you some things that are uh, that will fit well with with what you're teaching and uh, connect to teaching a number of different things about uh, about the Cold War. So we're happy you're here. We'll we'll give people another minute or so to to get in and get settled. Um, and then we'll we'll get started. But as you're joining us, we'd love for you to to tell us uh, where you're joining from. If you want to tell us what you teach, uh, those sorts of things. If uh, you want to tell us if you're middle school or high school or uh, some other level of teaching, I think uh, that'll probably help Genevieve and I, you know, at least steer you in the right direction on some things. I know I need to I need to figure out how to get some great background music into into my zoom meetings as well it's the next next level i'm we're, we're gonna get there there we go awesome all right we have people from all over the country from uh michigan from dc from oregon from texas uh new jersey middle school high school wonderful to see all of you folks and let's uh, let's go ahead and, and get started. Genevieve, are you ready? I am ready. Fantastic. All right. So tonight uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of early-ish Cold War. Not quite 1950s, but that early 1960s period. Um, and and hopefully share some some wonderful resources with you. Uh, again, I love that uh, that you're joining us this evening. Um, my guess is if we went around the room and asked you about weather, at least this time of year, you'd have plenty of things to say as well. Uh, I will say I'm I'm joining you from Madison, Wisconsin, where uh, it was a balmy and unseasonable uh, 43 degrees. So a little, well, not terribly super warm, but uh, a little above average. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to get on a plane and head to Greensboro, North Carolina, where the high is like 70. So uh, fingers crossed it, it stays that way. Um, so yes, wonderful to, to have you here. Um, if you would like to follow along, if you're one of those folks uh, that, uh, that sort of wants to have this at your disposal, or you're one of those folks that likes to peek ahead, um, the bit.ly for, uh, for this slide deck uh, is not only in the chat, Felice just uh, put it there. Felice uh, Yargja is uh, the education manager at Retro Report. She's joining us tonight. Um, she'll be popping things into the chat. You might also see things from Caroline Watkins, uh, who is our audience engagement manager. She'll be putting things into the chat as well. Um, but yeah, the other thing is, if you're like, no, Dave, I need to sit back and, and let it wash over me and learn things, totally fine. I promise you, I will send everyone here tonight a, a follow-up email uh, with all of these resources, the, the slide deck links, uh, links from Retro Report, links from the, the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, the, the whole bit. So here's what we got. So this is us. Like I said, my name is David Olson. I'm the Director of Education at Retro Report. Uh, I'm coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin, although Retro Report is, uh, is based in New York City. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Retro Report in a minute, but I'll, I'll turn it over here to Genevieve. Thanks, Dave. Um, my name is Genevieve Kaplan. I'm the Director of Education at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, coming to you from Dallas, Texas, where, sorry, Dave, it was like 82 here today. What? Um, <laughs> we were I was talking, we had some school, a school group this morning that came from Maryland the night before. And so we were comparing weather uh, all morning. They were very happy for 82, given they were doing an outdoor service project this morning. Uh, but we're, we're glad to have you. And I look forward to chatting with everybody throughout the next hour and sharing all of the resources that we've got. Wonderful. And I, even though, you know, Genevieve will, will give a wonderful plug and explanation uh, about the Sixth Floor Museum, but as a non-employee of said museum, I, I will also happily endorse it. Um, when I traveled earlier this fall to uh, the Texas Council for the Social Studies Conference, which was held just north of Dallas, um, I made it a point to 
to go see this museum. It was, uh, you know, as a history nerd, it was one of those things that uh, that was on my my list of of must see spots, um, and it it did not disappoint. It's an absolutely fantastic museum. If you ever find yourself in the the Dallas area. Um, the F- Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, I believe, is the term of art. If you ever find yourself there, by all means, uh, go check it out. It is well worth your time. Uh, although I probably don't have to do too much convincing for a group that will show up for a webinar about the Cold War on a Tuesday evening in February. So, <laughs> all right. So our our goals for this evening. Um, is that we're going to check out some resources. Uh, we have some some wonderful things, some lessons, activities, video resources, interactive resources that we're going to share. Um, specifically, you know, kind of honing in on this time period of the Cold War uh, in the 1960s. And then uh, I think between the things that Genevieve and I will share with you um, are a number of strategies and resources that help us engage with things like cause and effect, um, developing arguments, looking at change and continuity over time, you know, all of those wonderful, you know, thinking like a historian uh, concepts, along with what I think is really important um, in, in everyone's classroom is finding ways to link past and present. Um, I am a, a huge proponent of, of helping your students uh, and advocating for you to, to find ways to help your students connect history to, to the world that's uh, that's all around them today. So hopefully some of the resources that, that Genevieve and I will share will, will allow you to do that. Um, I know there's a number of people uh, here that are familiar with either one of our uh, organizations. Some of you might be really familiar with both, uh, but just to make sure we're all on a level playing field, both Genevieve and I want to say a little bit about our respective organizations. Um, unlike uh, the amazing museum that Genevieve works for, uh, Retro Report, although we have an office, we're not a, we're not a place-based institution. Um, all of our resources uh, really are, are virtual. They're digital resources. So we are a a nonprofit, nonpartisan journalism organization. Um, and what we do primarily is create short form documentary films, really with the express purpose, the explicit intention of finding ways to link past and present. So we'll we'll talk about some of those. Um, we have a whole bunch of resources uh, that you can use across US history, world history, civics and government, geography, psychology, uh, English, environmental studies, all sorts of different things. Um, we have over 275 short films, all of which are entirely free on our website. And then uh, a collection of lesson plans, student activities, and other resources that honestly grows almost by the week. Um, and what we're going to do tonight is take a look at some brand new resources that we just published, um, and then sort of a, a, a look at our larger collection of Cold War resources. So that's what Retro Report is. Genevieve, tell us about the Sixth Floor Museum. All right. So the Sixth Floor Museum, in case anybody doesn't know who we are, you're probably very familiar with our content, even though you might not recognize the name. So the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza is the location of the former Texas School Book Depository Building, which is where they found evidence of a shooter on November 22nd, 1963, uh, when President Kennedy was assassinated. So here in the picture, uh, you can see the Texas School Book Depository building as it appeared in 1963 and how it appears today. Our graphic designer has done some absolutely beautiful work on uh, creating this merged image. But one of the things that we really pride ourselves in in the education department is being able to talk about all kinds of subjects, not just relating to President Kennedy and the assassination, but also looking at his legacy. Um, so you want me to go I can actually one? advance the slide. Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> there on we it. Go. So we do lots of on-site as well as virtual programming for kids in grades four through 12 that focus on anything from civil rights and civics to looking at primary source usage, whether it is through our history detectives program that focuses on different initiatives throughout the 1960s that Kennedy was connected to, or through our conflicting evidence program, which allows students to work with 
evidence collected within the first 24 hours of the assassination of President Kennedy, and they are able to go through, assess the images that we're sharing with them and come up with their own conclusions on what they think happened based on the evidence that's presented to them. We've also got a bunch of great online resources in the format of uh, lesson plans and classroom activities. And uh, we have a really cool feature about our online collections where you can actually go into our collection, sign up for a free account, and you can create your own curated collections of images to use in your classroom. On top of that, we've also created a bunch of collections as well so that you've got things right at your fingertips. And one of those collections that we've got is focused on the Cold War and communism and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And all of that is right at your fingertips at jfk.org. And specifically, if you go to the Learn tab, you'll find all of our education resources as well as collections and some of our online uh, interpretation as well. So we do a whole lot. Um, I definitely encourage you to check it out. And if you don't see exactly what you're looking for, get a hold of us or, you know, any museum, really. We always have way more behind the scenes and we can put out in front of people, whether it's online or in the exhibit, but we love to help out. That's awesome. I, and really the, the genesis of, of this partnership of, of Genevieve and I and our, our organization sort of joining forces this evening um, really stemmed from, you know, not only my, uh, my visit and, and love of the museum, uh, but I, I came to Genevieve and said, hey, we, we have filmmakers working on, on this new film uh, about the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'd, we'd love to not only showcase it for teachers, but uh, find a great partner to do so. Uh, and Genevieve's response was, we've got new stuff about the Cuban Missile Crisis too. So we thought it was, uh, was pretty natural for us to, to team up here. Um, and so here, what I'll, sh I'll take you through some of the, the Retro Report resources, um, including this brand new film, which uh, was published late last week along with a brand new lesson in student activity, which uh, I think we just published yesterday. Um, so hot, you know, as hot off the presses as you can get for things that only exist digitally. Um, and here, one of the things you'll notice is uh, the title of this film, um, you know, does evoke more than just the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Again, the goal here is, is to try to, to find those connections uh, between history and the present. Um, and what we'll see, so we're going to watch a, a snippet of the film. The film itself is 11 minutes long uh, in full, but we're only going to watch a, a short chunk. Um, and what we'll see here, hopefully, in, in the uh, lesson and activity, um, is some of these questions about how do people make decisions and how do the decisions they make um, set in motion uh, a new chain of events? And, you know, how might those things have been different if people had chosen differently? I know, you know, looking at uh, the resources that uh, that Genevieve has to share, I think sort of in that same mode of this is one of those great moments in history to look at the importance of sound decision making, uh, of communication, um, and, and to see how, you know, small differences in decision making uh, may have dramatically altered history. Um, and so here you'll see with the lesson, we're going to see if we can identify some cause and effect relationships, both between within historic examples as well as contemporary conflicts. Um, so we're going to take a, a peek at just a short chunk of this film. Tomás Díaz Acosta grew up in Cuba during Batista's rule. La influencia cultural de Estados Unidos era muy fuerte. Estados Unidos era uno de los países aliados que lucharon contra el bloque nazifascista. Pero a nosotros nos preguntaban por qué Estados Unidos permite una dictadura corrupta y violenta como era la de Batista. Tenía una gran simpatía por esos combatientes que peleaban en las montañas orientales contra esa dictadura. From his stronghold in the wild Sierra Maestre Mountains, Cuba's Fidel Castro emerged triumphant after two years of guerrilla warfare against the Batista regime. 
Rising to power in 1959, revolutionary Fidel Castro pushed to rid Cuba of American influence. Steps taken by Castro aimed at reducing trade between the United States and Cuba. Castro says the Cuban revolutionary government has no reason to offer explanations to America or to anyone. When the promise of democratic elections didn't materialize, along with Castro embracing Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, Officials in Washington worried Cuba might become the first communist regime in the Western Hemisphere and a new front in the growing Cold War. Soon there was a plan set in motion by the United States to deal with uh, Castro to overthrow him. This was the campground of the proud and optimistic Cuban brigade, trained by the CIA and perhaps the largest covert operation in the history of subversion. I remember being told by our CIA trainers, you know, some of you might not make it. In the early morning darkness of April 17, 1961, anti-Castro expats trained by the American government came ashore along Cuba's Bay of Pigs. Eduardo Zayas Bazan was one of them. I joined a group of 12 frogmen. We had no prior military training whatsoever. But we were convinced that if the Americans were backing us, we were going to be successful. Instead, the mission was a half-baked disaster, easily snuffed out by Castro. The people have been exhorted by Castro to push back the invaders. President John F. Kennedy, in office less than three months, had tried to conceal the United States' involvement. These charges are totally false. The Bay of Pigs disaster was a military and diplomatic defeat for the new president. All right. So, like I said, that was uh, that was just a, a chunk, about a two and a half, three minutes of an 11 minute film. That one also is is sort of lead in for you. Um, if you watch the, the rest of the film, not only does it go through the Cuban Missile Crisis, but then uh, later on, it makes connections to uh, what's currently happening with uh, with. Uh, Russia and Ukraine. I'll play just a, a small portion of that portion part here. This time after Russia invaded neighboring Ukraine. Putin's invasion has been a test for the ages. Test for America, test for the world. This is not a bluff. Those who try to blackmail us with nuclear weapons, the prevailing winds can turn in their direction. This war in Ukraine most likely inaugurates Cold War II. Both Khrushchev and Putin were trying to get on par with the United States. Putin is a more unpredictable leader. Khrushchev had direct personal experience of war in a way that Putin never had. And All right, I'll stop it there. Um, so I have, uh, I could talk about this film uh, for, for a long time, probably longer than the 11 minutes, but I, I certainly won't. Um, one of the things I think is is unique about this, and I know there's a, a, a chunk of folks uh, who have joined us tonight who joined Retro Report um, last spring when we did a whole series looking at the, the Cold War in Latin America. Um, and one of the things I talked about then and, you know, talk about often when teaching the Cold War is that, you know, in my experience, you know, when we talked about the Cold War in Latin America Cuba was often the only place we looked. It was Bay of Pigs invasion, Cuban Missile Crisis, and now we're we're elsewhere. We're you know off to Vietnam and you know and Asia, Europe, and that's about it. Um, and here, even though this does focus on Cuba, I think one of the things that makes this film unique is in all of the resources that I've seen and used in my own classroom over the years, um, I never, I never had things that, uh, that actually, where we actually heard from Cubans. Um, and so to me, that's, that's one of the, the shining spots of this film is that uh, we actually hear from a Cuban who had joined, you know, Castro's rebel forces. And we hear from uh, a Cuban uh, who was part of the Bay of Pigs invasion, trained by the CIA. Um, and so here we're, we're hearing from the people directly affected, not sort of just the, the disembodied American position. 
So here, uh, there's a, a link here directly to, to get you to this lesson. I'll, I'll take you through uh, what the website looks like here. So this page uh, is the, the Retro Report library page. It's where you can find um, all of our individual films that have classroom resources, a number of different collections, things like that. Um, they tend to have some of the more recent ones uh, up at the top. Um, so here, the Cuban Missile Crisis film that we that we just saw a snippet of is up towards the top. But you'll see, you know, we have things that look at uh, political parties and conventions, environmental education, uh, different aspects of civics and government and, and things like that. So if we go here to the Cuban Missile Crisis page, this is the, the lesson plan page where you'll find uh, a short snippet about this film. You'll also find the links for the, the classroom resources as well. Uh, just one quick note here for our parlance, uh, the, the term lesson plan, we use that to refer to the teacher facing document. So here, the lesson plan for the Cuban Missile Crisis um, tells you, you know, what kind of class you might use it in, what sort of objectives, materials, and then how you would actually go through the lesson. The student activity is the student facing document. So this is what uh, you would make a copy of. Again, they're in Google Docs to try to make it as easy as possible for you to make a copy, make what edits you need, change questions, add or, or delete certain portions. Um, and here it asks students to, to go through, do a little uh, pre-work and, and see if they can uh, foresee what some of the connections might be with some key terms. Uh, there's a, a handful of questions related directly to the film. And then what it asks students to do is go through and process some of the different actions and reactions uh, that we see both from the United States and the Soviet Union uh, from the Bay of Pigs up through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and then as students go through and, and make these connections between what did someone do and how did someone react, Really, the goal here is to figure out, well, what are some of the things that could have gone different uh, had people made different decisions along the way? Um, and then ask students to identify four different actions and decisions uh, that they think were most influential. Um, and whether or not those actions brought us closer to nuclear war or helped reduce tensions or, or perhaps uh, somewhere in between or a little bit of both. And then... What we've, uh, what we've asked students to do is to uh, learn a little bit more about the, the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine um, and, and figure out what they think ought to be done. Uh, and we can even have them analyze in, in the same sort of way. What are some actions and reactions that we see in this current conflict? Um, and I think we've uh, we've done a good job both with uh, the person who wrote the lesson and then uh, Felice Yargaja, our education manager, of compiling some great resources. Uh, if you want students to take a position on uh, you know what the United States ought to do with the the war in Ukraine, everything from sending direct military aid uh, to staying out of it altogether imposing economic sanctions. Uh, there are a number of resources where you can point students to, uh, to begin to do some of that research uh, for themselves. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the lesson that goes with this video. Uh, again, I think it, it does a good job of not only laying out what are some of the key moments in, in not only those 13 days, but some of the lead up, but also connecting it directly to what's happening in our world today. All right. I'm going to go along here. Um, so here, uh, you know, especially the, uh, the events of the past week, if anyone has been following the news and seeing uh, not only is there sort of continued saber rattling, but uh, with uh, how Russia approaches the, the, the West, um, but Russia even pulling out of, uh, of a nuclear arms treaty. Um, and so here, having your students, you know, focus on not only some of the, the things happening in current events happening, you know, just days, days ago, uh, but how that relates back to some some moments in history. Um, so we actually have a, a really great film that uh, that connects here uh, called The Cold War and the Nuclear Weapons Threat. Um, that sort of asked the question, has the end of the Cold War reduced the nuclear weapons threat or not? 
Um, and uh, looking at the history of, well, how did we get to a point where both sides had tens of thousands uh, of different weapons at their disposal? One of the things I really like about this lesson uh, and activity is it has students dive deeply into uh, some of some of that data analysis uh, that, you know, I was talking to a, a friend in Virginia who was telling me that uh, data analysis is now part of their standards in their state. Um, and so, you know, great opportunity for social studies teachers uh, to be bringing in charts, graphs, other data visualization uh, sorts of resources. So we're going to take a, a very short look at a, at a clip from this film, too. This is not the test. United States is under nuclear attack. In the 1950s and 60s, a government campaign made sure that Americans were prepared for the possibility of a nuclear attack from our main adversary, the Soviet Union. Enemy jet bombers carrying nuclear weapons can sweep over a variety of routes and drop bombs on any important target in the United States. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew there were even cartoons aimed at children. <laughs> We must be ready Duck all the time for the atomic cover. bomb. Duck and cover. Duck and cover. When I teach my class at Stanford, invariably some student will ask me, how in the world did we end up with 70,000 nuclear weapons during the Cold War? Former Secretary of Defense William Perry tells his students that the massive arsenals helped deter the two sides from using them. We believed the other country was planning to conduct a surprise attack on us. And therefore, we had to have enough weapons to survive that surprise attack. A payload larger than any the Russians have launched. We saw their weapons going up, and we responded to that. And it was a back and forth cycle. At this moment, we could explode 11,500 nuclear weapons on the Soviet Union, and they can explode 9,500 weapons on us, beginning 30 minutes from right now. But Perry says Americans were worrying about the wrong thing. The danger was not that one side would deliberately attack the other side, a surprise attack, a bolt out of the blue, but that we would blunder into a nuclear war. Will it be bad? It will be a holocaust. It will be hell. It will be the end of everything we know. For decades, the looming nuclear threat permeated American culture. They will not reach their targets for at least another hour. I am, I am positive, Dimitri. The Soviets launch a surprise attack. There's no time. 23 minutes from warning to impact. Six minutes of itself. All right. I had to... I had to let it go a little longer than, than maybe I should have because I had to include Dr. Strangelove, the little clip. It's my all time favorite movie. Um, and I, I'm, yeah, a giant. My, my wife will tell you I'm insufferable. Um, so I, I think this one does a, you know, obviously a very timely film for, for what we're experiencing now. Um, and here we can take a look quick. Uh, this is the, the lesson plan page um, and then the student activity that goes with this one. Uh, where you have students go through the film, examine some of these aspects of nuclear buildup, and then with the fall of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, some of the drawdown in in stockpiles. Uh, but then uh, here, there's some political cartoon analysis, uh, and then some some wonderful map and other data visualization analysis. So this one uh, shows uh, in 2022 the estimated number of nuclear warheads by country uh, across the globe. Um, and then uh, this one shows uh, estimated global nuclear warhead inventories from the post-war period uh, to 2022. Uh, and then finally, this one I, I really like looks at the history of nuclear tests and disarmament treaties. Um, so how have those those times when countries actually came together uh, to, to talk and to work on these things, how has that impacted uh, how, how countries across the globe have uh, created, developed, and tested weapons uh, over time? So some resources to, to go with that as well. 
Um, we do have a, a number of, of other resources connected with the Cold War. Um, one of my absolute favorites and, and what sort of year over year is one of our uh, most popular films uh, that gets used is called uh, The Cold War from the Truman Doctrine to the Berlin Airlift. Uh, it features an amazing interview uh, with uh, one of the people who was... Uh, who dropped candy bars to children in Berlin during uh, the beginning of the Berlin airlift. Uh, Gail Halverson, who is, uh, we were able to interview him uh, when he was in his late 90s uh, a few years ago. Uh, just an absolute treasure of a human being talking about his experience there. Um, and so we have a, we also have an entire Cold War in Latin America collection. I'll, I'll show you just a sneak peek of this before I turn it over to, to Genevieve. But our Cold War in Latin America collection, which I know uh, a number of you uh, are, have seen and used before, includes five different films, seven different lessons, along with an interactive map. Um, not only sort of an overview, but also uh, some case studies looking more in depth at Chile and El Salvador. And then a number of other Cold War resources, uh, looking at things like the Korean War, the Berlin Airlift. Um, nuclear winter, uh, a number of different things that that can slot in. You know, if you're if you're doing a, a unit on the Cold War, you know we we have quite a few films which you can uh, which you can slot in over the course of that. I'll show you very quickly uh, what what some of those connection or collections look like. So here, our global Cold War collection uh, has not only the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis film. Uh, and the the nuclear weapons threat, which we just saw a snippet of. Here's the Berlin Airlift film, the Korean War film, uh, one about uh, Joseph McCarthy, space race, and then our Cold War in Latin America collection as well. Um, so yes, we have a, a ton of these resources. Um, I encourage you to take a look. And like I said, we will we will be happy to to share all of these resources. I'll be sending everybody an email with, with links to all of these. All right, I'm gonna move on now to uh, to Genevieve and uh, let's learn about some of the resources from the, the Sixth Floor Museum. All right, well, thank you. So what we're gonna show for the next 20 minutes or so is a um, teacher resource that we have that's gonna be coming out in the next few weeks. We're, working on the final tweaks, making sure we have this looking exactly right. But what I'm going to share with you is a Cold War Cuban Missile Crisis kind of scenario-based situation where as we go through day by day of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, the students are being put in the position of having to be President Kennedy or uh, Khrushchev and or any of their advisors having to make decisions that are going to impact the future of uh, the, I'm tripping over my words, I always do this, but it's going to really impact what happens next in this 13 day standoff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on the first section so that you can get a feel for how this is organized and the conversation points. I'm going to present everybody with one of the conversation and decision points slides, and I'd love for folks to put their ideas in the chat. Um, and then we'll continue on. We'll go through so you can see some of the other questions that are involved with this. But essentially what this is, is that you can assign your students to go through this and they can be just outside observers who are thinking about what they would do if they were Kennedy and Khrushchev, or you can set them up so that they're broken into small teams who represent different advisors to President Kennedy. And based off of their background and their person's perspective, they have to advise Kennedy on what exactly uh, he should do. And then you can go through the entire thing and show here's these different perspectives. And this is what Kennedy went with. This is the reasoning why. And then continue all the way through the Cuban Missile Crisis like this. So starting off with October 14th of 1962, We've got the American U-2 spy plane is doing a flyover of Cuba, photographs those missile in installations, 
and captures uh, information that the United States had really not been as on top, not on top of, but really not uh, aware of how in depth and how much involvement had been going on with building up these missile sites in Cuba. All right. Next slide. Yeah. So then on the 15th, the CIA analysts start going and they're looking through all these photos and they start seeing more and more uh, launch sites and the capability of them hitting the United States is very, very high. In fact, it gets to the point where they can pretty much hit every single city, major city in the United States, with the exception of maybe Seattle. All right. So here you can see that uh, radius of the how far they can go. And on October 16th of 1962, President Kennedy has an early morning meeting with McBundy George, who is the, NS, uh, the National Security Advisor, and he informs President Kennedy, hey, we've got a problem. Um, he proceeds to tell him about the Soviet missiles in Cuba. And then Kennedy immediately says, we need to pull the advisors together. We need to figure out what to do. So next slide. So these are the three options that are presented. They could do an air attack on the Soviet missile sites. They could do continued surveillance and diplomacy with Fidel Castro and Nikita Khrushchev. Or they could do a naval quarantine to prevent reinforcements. Note the use of quarantine and not blockade. They'd use the word blockade when it, been an, it would have been an act of war. So they were very, very careful to call it a quarantine. So that being said, with these three options that have been presented, what uh, I'm going to ask everybody to do is to think about these three options and decide which one would you advocate for. And when you decide which one you want to advocate for, give your reasoning why. So we can go to that next slide. So these are the, the full questions that we have in the uh, lesson plan or in the activity, where it's what are the pros and cons of each option? What are the possible responses from the Soviets for each option? And which one will you choose and why? So with this, what we do is if we've got people who are um, going to present this in terms of the different advisors, we actually have information sheets on each of the advisors so that that way there is a pers you get that person's perspective. You get to learn a little bit about them and how they think, and then um, they're able to answer those questions based off of what people are saying. So I see a few folks are dropping answers in the chat. So we've got uh, Athena who's saying no air attack on Soviet missile sites, no open nuclear war this close to Cuba on our doorstep. Um, let's see what else we've got. All right. And when you have uh, students go through this, are there are they able to to mix and match and say, well, let's do you know. This one, uh, along with this one, I think the, as Susan put, you know, quarantine, I wonder the looking at that, you know, is quarantine and diplomacy, those definitely aren't mutually exclusive, right? So maybe exactly. uh, having your students be able to, to advocate, you know, how you might approach, uh, would you just approach Khrushchev? Would you just approach Castro? Would you want to get both of them on the line kind of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. But it's, we always love to encourage students to not just strictly focus on the three options that were presented right then, but maybe they have a different idea that may, may work better. So absolutely. We encourage uh, people to students to think outside the box and to uh, really put their own thoughts into how they would handle this develop those skills of assessing a, situ a situation or a problem and be able to uh, come up with their own solutions. Yeah. We got continued surveillance, negotiate talks. Yeah. So lots of different ideas. So ultimately um, what we do is after the discussion and decision, and frequently we encourage that the students work in small groups 
um, and they can either present their response in a small group or they can re uh, present it individually. But we found that people generally tend to respond much better when they're working in groups, when they're doing this. So definitely something that I encourage, although I know that sometimes group conversations and things like that can tend to uh, go off topic a little bit, but it's a great way to uh, get the students thinking and being able to, to digest some of these more complex uh, situations that the United States was dealing with in President Kennedy and his advisors. All right, so I'm on to the next one. So ultimately, Kennedy decides he's going to conduct the naval quarantine. Like I said, he's deliberately not calling it a blockade. Don't want to start another war if they don't have to. Um, and one of the pros that he specifically was looking at about doing a naval quarantine is that it did provide that longer time to use diplomacy, trying to negotiate a missile withdrawal. Um, all right, so the next one. So October 18th and 19th, he continues to do, uh, it continues to work diplomacy. He had representatives from the Soviet government come to see him in the White House, and they were playing this interesting game where they nobody was revealing their cards, and the Soviets were saying, oh, this was strictly, you know, we're just doing this for defensive purposes. We're just trying to make sure that Cuba is able to properly defend itself. Kennedy, at the same time, is not revealing. We know what's going on, and we know about how big the buildup is and all of that. Um, interestingly enough, in the middle of these 13 days, Kennedy heads out to fulfill campaign promise or promises to go campaign in Ohio and Illinois. Um, I always like to put this in if for no other reason. It's a little personal connection for me. Uh, my grandfather was a Secret Serviceman who was actually involved in the Illinois uh, appearances. But also, uh, interestingly, tying into the Sixth Floor Museum, when he made that appearance in Springfield, Illinois in October of 1962, uh, after the motorcade had gone through downtown Springfield, Kennedy was on his way to the state fairgrounds to make his speech. People spotted a rifle being pointed out of the window, aimed at exactly where the motorcade had been. And immediately security bells were going off. People were being taken into custody and all of this. Um, but they, the people said, no, we weren't doing anything like that. We were just playing around. Uh, little did anyone know that just over a year later, that scenario would repeat itself, except it would be a completely different outcome. All and right. as, uh, as someone who looks at this, you know, with a political lens as well, thinking, you know, these are, this is just a few weeks before a midterm election, uh, and, you know, in a in a first midterm for a president, uh, when they're often thinking about, uh, am I gonna get uh, am I gonna get shellacked at the polls, and my party's gonna you know lose seats in Congress, especially since uh, not long before he had had another disaster in Cuba with the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. So uh, I'm sure you know that. This is a this is a big deal that Kennedy makes a, a handful of campaign stops during the course of this. Absolutely. And um, on our, October 20th, they ended up deciding Kennedy had to get back to the White House. And so he was in Chicago at the time and decided that they were going to say that Kennedy had a cold and he needed to go back to Washington. And that's how they got him out without revealing anything that was going on at the time. So on October 20th, Kennedy makes that decision, move forward with the quarantine. On the 22nd, Kennedy's got to start letting people know what's going on. So he's calling uh, pres former presidents Hoover, Truman, and Eisenhower. Um, he is, XCOM is formally organizing daily meetings. Cabinet and Congress are, is being informed of the situation. And then finally, Kennedy has to inform the American public. So we'll do that next slide. So on October 22nd, Kennedy goes on uh, national television, makes an address to the nation revealing what's been going on 
and that there will be this naval quarantine and lays out the demand that the Soviets withdraw their missiles. Um, this was something, oh, you're right, 1962, not 1963. I'm so in the habit of saying 1963 because of the assassination. So I apologize if I... Comes up every once in a while at the museum. Is that... <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed when I was going through putting this presentation together, I'm like, all right, right the two, not the three. So yes. So I apologize if I slip and I say 63 instead of 62. Um, but Kennedy goes on national television. They do the, they announce the blockade and then next slide. On the 22nd, there's a letter that comes from Khrushchev to Kennedy delivered by the U.S. ambassador. Um, and uh, it says, and I'm going to read this. It says, the one thing that most has most concerned me has been the possibility that your government would not correctly understand the will and determination of the United States in any given situation. Since I have not assumed that you or... Uh, should be you and not your, you or any other sane man would in this nuclear age deliberately plunge the world into war, which it is crystal clear no country could win and which could only result in catastrophic consequences to the world, including the aggressor. Khrushchev responds the following day and again repeats, these are only for defensive purposes. We're not doing anything. We're not trying to provoke anything. And no, we're not going to remove the missiles to which Kennedy comes back and says, you started this. So it's kind of starting to be like, well, you did this. Well, you did this. Well, you did this. And it, starting to see this almost like spiraling into, oh, my gosh, are we going to spiral completely out of control? And we are going to do this one upsmanship and finger pointing until we um, are able to resolve this peacefully or through military force. All right, so next slide. Um, October 23rd and 24th, Ally Stevenson, who is the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, starts going to the U.N. Security Council. Uh, the sh U.S. ships are moving into position, as are Soviet submarines and freighters. And it's looking like things are really getting very much, in very, very intense. So next slide. And on the 25th, Adlai Stevenson absolutely goes after the Russian uh, ambassador to the United Nations. Adlai Stevenson presents the, the United States case, shows the photos. There are great recordings of this that you can find easily on YouTube that just show Stevenson just absolutely trying to force the Russians to say yes we actually, or the Soviets saying, yes, we do have missiles there, trying to acknowledge it. And the Russians keep saying, I will get back to you. We'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. In the meantime, there is a Soviet oil tanker that um, starts approaching the U.S. quarantine zone. And it really pushes the question of what do you do? Do you uh, intercept the ship? Do you let it go through? And so we asked students there, how do, how do you respond? What do you do? Because this is, you've got the whole world watching you now and all of this is happening simultaneously. So ultimately, and we'll do the next slide. Um, ultimately, Kennedy does decide to let the, the ship go through, but the on the following day, Fidel Castro sends Khrushchev a letter saying, you know what? We need to launch a first strike against the U.S. We need to go on the offensive. And Khrushchev is really kind of stuck because he's starting to realize things have gotten very much out of control. And so, again, we put the question to the students as a group, if you were Khrushchev, what would you decide to do? Do you agree with Castro? Do you launch a strike or do you contact Kennedy and start talking de-escalation, acknowledging that things got way out of hand? What are the pros and cons of each? And what are the risks, not just for Khrushchev and Kennedy, but for Castro as well? These are high stakes games. And uh, this is really that turning point where we start to see, okay, we it, things have gotten out of, out of control. So next slide. Um, following up the next day, 
YouTube pilot is shot down and killed over Cuba. And this is where Kennedy says we are now in an entirely new ballgame. And this is where it, the game of trust between Kennedy and Khrushchev becomes absolutely critical. And so Kennedy and Khrushchev have to trust each other enough to say, was this an accident? Was it not? And Kennedy ultimately does decide to go along and trust his gut and faith in Khrushchev to say this was not an intentional opening act of war. Um, and then the negotiations started to happen to defuse the situation. So next slide. And here we come on October 28th, 1962 with the final discussion and decision point of discussing the petition, the position of each nation regarding the negotiations and what agreement they came to. With the agreement details being that the Soviets will withdraw the missiles from Cuba, the United States will withdraw missiles from Turkey, and the United States will not attack Cuba after the Soviet withdrawal. So students are able to have these moments to look at, okay, do you accept this? Do you not accept this? What other terms might you suggest? Is there a way that not only can you look at this as a way to diffuse the long or the short-term situation, but also how do you use it as a way to begin to diffuse the long-term situation? All right, next slide. So making these connections to today, I want to really point you to the second bullet point, which is October 22nd, 1962. So this is the second to last day. It's the day before uh, the uh, agreement is announced. You see that the 10th Strategic Missile Squadron, which is based at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, they, their Minuteman 1 missiles become alert ready. Um, and so the, all of a sudden it's like, okay, there's escalation that, that's going on, uh, not quietly, but not out in the open. This is how close the U.S. was thinking things were getting. By July of 1963, the 12th and the 490th Strategic Missile Squadrons become operational, which meant that there were 15 flights consisting of 150 missiles were ready. So in September of 1963, September 26th of 1963, Kennedy is out traveling the country on his conservation tour of the West when he goes to Great Falls, Montana, which is just west of Malmstrom uh, Air Force Base. And he says, we have many thousands of we are many thousands of miles from the Soviet Union, but this state in a very real sense is only 30 minutes away. So echoing what was in the video just a few minutes ago. All right, next slide. So why is this important? Why am I focusing on Montana? So connecting it to today, Minuteman missile fields, this is a map of where they are. The black areas are deactivated and the red areas are still active. And Montana has um, currently has about 100 missiles remaining today. And I just saw somebody ask the question, why Montana? So the buildup in Montana in the early 1960s was done because the United States government felt that they needed a space where their population was not very dense. And if they, the Soviets were to be, attack, that there would, it would help to be the lowest loss of life. So bringing it forward. No, uh, next slide. Yes, thank you. Connecting it to today, this is Montana just a couple of weeks ago. Those Chinese spy balloons that were photographed, were photographed over Billings, Montana. Malmstrom Air Force Base is 219 miles northwest of Billings. And the trajectory of those uh, balloons had them coming from Alaska down through Canada. And the way that those balloons were moving is that it would have brought them very close to those active uh, missile bases in Montana. So that's one way that you can connect what's going on in the news, what's capturing people's attention right now, going right back to 1961, 1962, 1963, um, with the buildup of missiles in the continental United States. All right.
So uh, I'm going to pause there. Thank you very much, Genevieve. I, I, I'm excited myself to, uh, to take a look at some of those resources. Um, and I, I think there would be fantastic to have students work through this process, build some of those, those great speaking and listening skills as they go through and, uh, and, and talk through the different scenarios. I think that'll be, be excellent. So before we have a, a few questions, few minutes for, uh, for Q and A, uh, in just a second here, I do want to to let folks know. Um, not only are we incredibly thankful that you've joined us uh, for an hour this evening, but um, what you'll be receiving is a, a follow up email from me that has all of the resources that we shared this evening, along with a very short survey. Um, I know at Retro Report, uh, along with you know other partners, we always want to hear um, what went well, what can we do better. Um, do you plan on using resources? Are there are there other things that uh, that you're looking for from organizations like ours? Um, and so this is also the way. Uh, if you're one of those folks who uh, you know attends PD at least in part to to make sure you can get that certificate to you know go earn more money or renew license or that sort of thing, um, I will uh, create uh, certificates of attendance again uh, for folks but you got to do the survey. You got to give us a little feedback and then, and then I'm happy to to send that your way. Um, and then um, I know uh, for both Genevieve and I, we would love to hear from, from folks. If there uh, are resources here that you particularly enjoyed or have questions about other resources, either from retro report or the sixth floor museum, um, we, we would be happy to, to be in touch with teachers. That's uh that's why we have the jobs we have is to uh, is to try to help teachers and 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 help their experience with both uh, students and their own professional learning. 